Hello booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. It's my Sunday night routine making a booktube video while enjoying a, a glass or five of wine. I don't think I've ever had more than two while making a video. You think you'd know it if I got to three. Maybe I'd start making sense. If I start making sense, you know I'm drunk. <laughs> I am doing another grab and gab tag and this one is the anything but physical books edition. So here's a question for you. This is not a snarky question. It's a real question. Why do none of us on BookTube include ebooks and audiobooks on our book hauls? We don't. Have you ever seen anybody include ebooks or audiobooks on their book hauls? They're included in our wrap ups and our reviews and whatnot, but never on our book hauls. There's a sense of they don't fit the bill for actual ownership or acquisition or possession in the way that a physical book does. So I think that's really fascinating. In my original description of this anti-tag, I said the books that you grab off the shelf don't literally have to be on the shelf. They can be ebooks or audiobooks, but I've never included any of those in this tag and neither has anybody else who I've seen do it. So I'm going to push the envelope. I'm going to tag outside the box, off the shelf, and only include books that are in my Kindle, that I've bookmarked on my Scribd subscription, which is a mixture of ebooks and audiobooks, in my Audible, now discontinued, in my Amazon wish list, in my TBR, that I don't physically possess. And let's see how it goes. And this again will be a mixture of books that I've read or want to read. So the first one I have not read, it is on the short list for the Center for Fiction's first novel prize this year, which I believe has not been awarded. I was just on their webpage very briefly a few minutes ago and I don't believe the winner has been announced. And this novel is called Empire of Glass by Caitlin Salamini. And this is a novel set in China. And Caitlin Salamini is not Chinese, but she lived in and studied in China for years. So that's always interesting. So that's the first thing, little warning lights go off when white writers write about people who aren't white, white. but I'm curious about it. This book has a book trailer. Those are a thing now. You probably knew that. So I'll put a link in the show notes to the trailer. There's footage about Caitlin Salamini when she was much younger and living in, I think she did a year's uh, homestay in China. And there's footage of the Chinese family that she homestayed with. And it's the story of that father that she has fictionalized. When she talked about her novel on the trailer, I was turned off because she talked like a professor. It was very ac academic. So I, my heart kind of sank. It's a bit of an over-dramatization of my reaction, but I wasn't impressed with the intellectual way she spoke about the novel. But when she read from the novel on this short trailer, I was impressed by the writing. So I definitely want to check this out. This is supposed to be a very experimental novel, which probably seven times out of ten doesn't work for me, but I'm curious. The novel opens in the mid-1990s. There's an American teenager who may be Chinese-American. Lao Ke, uh, uh, she is standing in a park in Beijing with her homestay mother who is dying of cancer and wants Lao to help her kill herself. Will she do it or not? Twenty years later, Lao receives a book written by her homestay mother. The book is called Empire of Glass. In the novel, Lao receives a book 20 years later, written by her homestay mother, called Empire of Glass, which she begins translating into English. And that's the novel we are reading. The novel chronicles the lives of this Chinese woman and her husband in pre- and post-revolutionary China. So, sounds pretty darned interesting. Have a look at the trailer and let me know what you think. Have any of you read it? I'm certainly curious. 
Next is a novel that I have read. I read it in ebook on my Scribd membership this spring. It's called Breath by Tim Winton. It's my first Tim Winton novel, and definitely not my last. This is a novel that I, the synopsis of which didn't do much for me because it's about a pair of teenage Australian boys living on the Western Australian coast, and they are big time surfers. And they meet a older hippie surfer who's quite famous as a surfer, and his American girlfriend, and they get very mixed up in these adults' lives, and the older guy trains them on extreme surfing. I am deeply disinterested in surfing. I didn't think I wanted to read a book about surfing, but I loved the gorgeous descriptions of the surfing scenes. It was just beautiful, and everything about the novel... Almost everything about the novel was wonderful. The writing, the characterization, I was sucked right in. It was a pretty disappointing ending, and this is the only novel I've read by Tim Winton. I want to read more, but even his diehard fans say he doesn't know how to end a novel. So, yeah, the, no the ending was kind of eh, but four-star four read. I, I liked it. And he This year he had a memoir come out, and I received a cop hardcover copy of it. I can see sitting on my... Sitting on my printer, beckoning to me as well. Next is a Canadian classic novel from 1964, The Stone Angel by Margaret Lawrence. I have this bookmarked in my Scribd folder as an e-book because I would like to reread it. I read it as a teenager, and it was probably most of it went over my head as a teenager, but I remember that I really liked it. It's one of the few Margaret Lawrence novels I've read. And Margaret Lawrence, nobody talks about her too much anymore. She died late 1970s, early 1980s. She's fairly young, like around age 60 of cancer. But she was a much loved and respected novelist in Canada. This novel is about a 90-year-old buzzard of an old lady. She's really... Uh, uh, not a very lovable uh, grandmotherly type at all. She's estranged from most of her family and friends, and she's on the verge of being shipped off to a nursing home and doesn't want to go, and she kind of wanders into the, the bush or into the wild, and it's kind of an odyssey of memory and uh, coming to terms with regrets in her life. I have a feeling I might find it a little bit overly symbolic, if I reread it now, but who knows? My memory of it is so dim. It is a classic, and I, I'm curious to see what I would think now. This is the best known of Margaret Lawrence's series of novels that are referred to as the Manawaka novels, which was the name of the fictionalized town in Manitoba where these stories were set. Next is a book I did on audio this year. God Help the Child by Toni Morrison. And I loved Beloved. Didn't l like jazz. Haven't read anything else by Toni Morrison, but I respect her greatly. But this was a terrible novel, I thought. I've reviewed the uh, Goodreads reviews of my friends and uh, other reviewers on Goodreads, and I would say 70% are glowing reviews. But I thought it was a piece of crap. I did it on audio, and it's about a blue-black. Her skin color is referred to as blue-black. So really, really dark-skinned African-American woman who's been a model and this and that. And she's such an unhappy woman. Part, mostly because her mother, who was light-skinned, didn't love her enough because she was such a dark-skinned uh, child. So... Okay, that's interesting, but it just felt like Toni Morrison, and this novel just came out a, a couple of years ago, and she, Toni Morrison is old now, and I just felt like she was doing her damnedest to shoehorn in all the trendiest issues from the headlines into this paper-thin plot, and it just didn't work for me at all. I just hated it. And poor Toni Morrison, she's the narrator, and her voice was giving out. And I hate to say it, but it felt like that was true in more ways than one. So, what did you think? A lot
lots of people thought it was as good as anything she's ever written, but I begged to differ. This is a wonderful novel I did on Kindle that I've kind of forgotten about. I read it about three years ago. When I was a teenager, I became, actually even pre-teenager, I became obsessed with the JFK assassination and all those conspiracy theories and all the, the history and biography of it. I read the William Manchester uh, history of the assassination, which is about 500 pages, I don't know, when I was 12 years old. I was deeply obsessed. I still remain fascinated by the Kennedy family, but the assassination and the con especially the conspiracy stuff, I'm not really interested. I'm curious to see what might come out now that doofus Trump has uh, authorized the release of some of the documents, but it's really not a, a fascination for me anymore. However, I did read this book, Dallas 1963, The Road to the Kennedy Assassination by Bill Minotaglio. What a fascinating cultural history of Dallas in 1963. And I read it before the election campaign, and boy, it would sure resonate for a reader now, post-Trump, the seismic hatred of the right wing in Dallas and all the stuff I didn't... There was background to the assassination that I didn't know that was just written in such lush and vivid detail that it reawakened my interest in the Kennedy assassination, but not the conspiracy part of it. I mean, you know, did Oswald do it alone? I don't know. Maybe we'll never know, but it was such a epoch-making cultural and historical event, and this book was so well written. I loved it. Another book that's on my Kindle that I haven't gotten to yet is a novel from maybe 2015, I'm not exactly sure, but fairly recent, by an African-American female writer. Her name is Caitlin Greenridge, and the novel is We Love You, Charlie, and this has gotten really good reviews. And now that I've reminded myself of it, I kind of want to push everything off my plate and read it. But I feel that way about many of the books that are on this list. This novel is about a... I don't remember the time exactly, but I think fairly modern, like 70s or 80s. But an African-American family, kind of upper middle class, or they are approached to take part in an experiment and live with an ape. Is it an ape or a gorilla? As a scientific experiment, and this African-American family knows sign language. Now, the synopsis doesn't explain why, but presumably they have a family member who's deaf. And they are to try to teach sign language to the ape or gorilla that they will be living with. So that's interesting. But as they begin this experiment, they find out that the institute that is sponsoring and administering this study has been up to some dirty tricks in terms of conducting experiments on African Americans historically and maybe close to the present, I don't know, that are re reminiscent of the real life Tuskegee experiments without their consent and whatnot. So it sounds just amazing. Have any of you read it? The next two are uh, kind of a shout out to my cousin Lindsay who I don't know if she's watching these videos, but I guess I'll find out if she doesn't comment on <laughs> this. But these are two books that she owns that I want to borrow, and they're non-fiction. They might be of interest to any of you that haven't quite finalized your non-fiction November list. I was with my cousin when she picked up a used copy of this in a Tokyo bookstore about a year ago, and I want to read it. And then I found out it's available as an audiobook, but once I explain what it's about, why would you ever do this book on audio? Unless you were following along with the book, because the book is richly illustrated from what I remember. It's called The Hair with Amber Eyes, and it's by the British ceramicist Edmund de Waal. I'm vaguely aware of him. Stress on the vaguely. So he is a descendant of the wealthy European Jewish banking dynasty family, the Efruzi family, which I'd never heard of. Then they were centered in Odessa, Vienna, and Paris, and they were peers of the Rothschilds. 
They lost everything in 1938 when the Nazis appropriated their property. They had a massive collection of the Japanese miniature sculptures called Netsuke. That's the Japanese pronunciation. I am finding out that, uh, as per usual, the Westerners are massacring the pronunciation. They're saying Netsuke or Netsuki or Netsuki. But anyway, so however it's pronounced in the West, I'm going with authentic Japanese to the degree that I can pronounce authentic Japanese, Netsuke. But these are priceless, very beautiful miniature sculptures. I've never actually seen them in real life. And I live in Tokyo. What's up with that? But he does a biographical excavation of his family through researching this collection that has been passed down through five generations. And it's supposed to be just incredible. I want to read it. How about you? The other one that my cousin Lindsay bought and read, and I believe she found out about this book from me, but that might be just my ego talking. But I heard about, I've been hearing about this book for about a year. I think it came out about a year ago. And I heard an extended interview on the uh NPR podcast here and now that I listen to almost every day with the author Jennifer Latson and the book is called The Boy Who Loved Too Much A True Story of Pathological Friendliness and this is just an incredible true story uh, about a boy who has Williams Syndrome which I had never heard of people with Williams Syndrome are born with none of the inherent wariness skepticism an inhibition that the rest of us are hardwired with. So they are gullible and overly trustworthy and overly friendly and can so easily be taken advantage of. They also have this, this rare genetic disorder also is characterized by an elfish appearance, sleeplessness, heart murmurs, and sensitivity to sound and developmental difficulties. But the biggest issue is that people are overly trusting, too friendly, and unconditionally loving to a fault. The story here is of a child, Eli, and her mother, Gail, with all kinds of other scientific background information, but the personal story is about this mother and child, Gail and Eli, and she can't let her son out of her sight because he will just approach anybody and want to hug them or ask for a hug or walk up to them with open arms, and, and I, I don't know how old he is when this is happening, but it, it just never... You never grow out of it. It's just at your core. Sounds amazing. The last two are novels that I have. One I have purchased and downloaded on my iBooks. It's called Erotic Stories for Punjabi Widows by Bali Kaur Jaswal. And it's new, I think, maybe last year, this year. And when I refreshed my memory about what it was about to prepare to make this video, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I want to start reading it tonight. So it's about a young Sikh woman, British woman of Indian descent, and she is kind of rebellious against her more traditional conservative parents and living a very Western, sexually liberated lifestyle. And I don't know if her parents kind of push her out or disown her, but she needs money, so she gets a part-time job as a creative writing instructor at a community center, and she gets all these Punjabi... <laughs> widows sign up because they think it's an ESL course but she actually had designed kind of a uh, erotic fiction course or that's basically what I get from it and so <laughs> it's quite comic results but as she gets you know so she's got her own issues with Sikh traditional values and these women are coming for language instruction and it's quite a mess but apparently turns out to be quite heartwarming so it could be just wonderful and I've heard really great things about it and I love the title erotic stories for Punjabi widows and the last one which uh, I would I give a definite eye roll to the title this was a uh, Booker International Prize listed book I don't remember long or short or only long listed but the title is fish have no feet and it's by John Kalman Stephenson. From what I hear, the sequel will be forthcoming with its working title, Humans Have No Gills. <laughs> All snarkiness aside, it sounds interesting. I'm interested in Icelandic 
culture and literature. I haven't read very much. I read the Hannah Kent historical novel that was set in Iceland and enjoyed it very much. But this is an actual Icelandic author, which I always privilege if I'm going to read about a country. I prefer to read it by a native writer. So that hence my bit of skepticism about the Ch Chinese novel by the American. Anyway, this Icelandic novel is set in Keflavik, which is the actual author's hometown. But in the novel, the protagonist is returning home. He's a writer and publisher, and he's been living in Copenhagen for many years. But his father's dying, so he comes home to his hometown in Iceland. And he had walked out on his wife and children two years before. And, of course, he is beset by childhood memories. And the story goes from there. Could be really great, could be so-so, could be awful, but I'm curious. Despite that awful title, that title might be really profound in Icelandic, but <laughs> fish have no feet. Uh-huh. I'd like to check it out. The ratings on Goodreads, which I don't put too much stock in the ratings, but the ratings among my friends there veer widely from so-so to five stars. So that's one I'm going to have to check out for myself. So that is my... Anything but physical books edition of the Grab and Gab tag. And I am not going to tag anyone specifically, but if you have not done this tag and you would like to do it, you can do the Anything but Physical Books edition if you want, or you can just do the normal Grab and Gab tag and pull books off your shelf. There are no rules whatsoever to this tag. And that's all from me. Thank you for your attention, and have a good day.